All right, Chambersburg School District. Uh, this is Chris Bigger bringing a state of the school district and schools to you um, for uh, March of 2024. The last two and a half, three months uh, that I've been here, I've been studying the district and put together a report. So the report uh, digitally is about 40 plus pages and you'll get access to that um, after this presentation. The 30 plus slides here are a shortened version of the state of the school district. So if you want a little more meat, a little more details behind this presentation, we do have a full page, 40 page report. Uh, state of the school district. So a self study for the purpose of comparing us to the state and also comparing the school district and schools to schools like us in size and in poverty. It's a challenge to use Franklin County schools, mainly, mainly because of size. We have some similarities in poverty, uh, but the size does add more complexities to a school district. So this, this report hopes to um, compare how we did with peer districts and also with the state. So there are a bunch of areas we've looked at um, in analyzing the safe self-study, prim primarily demographics and enrollment will be first, followed by finances, perceptions of the schools and school district, and then our educational performance overall. Uh, I dabble a little bit in staffing and safety, and then uh, I turn the attention to the future, which is about a blueprint for improving education in general in Maryland, and then what would Chambersburg's blueprint begin to look like with involvement of people in developing such a blueprint, and then some of our next steps moving forward to develop such a blueprint. So areas that we did not review in this presentation include athletics, facilities, support staff, technology, electives, and special courses with a formal start process with facilities um, in a feasibility study has already begun, but not ready to share necessarily results of that feasibility study. So enrollment demographics, what has changed? Where is Chambersburg now as opposed to maybe 10 years ago? Um, the school districts we compared ourselves to, uh, there are 10 total districts, uh, including us, that are like us, and it ranges between 6,400 students at Mill Creek and 12,900 students in Bethlehem Area School District. Free and reduced status goes from about 41% um, to a high of 65%. And this data is from 2022, with Chambersburg at 51% free and reduced. Um, and in 2023, we're at about 65% free and reduced. Um, so that's just a change in the year of the data, and you'll see that in slides to come. But that's our peer school district comparisons we'll use throughout the presentation and also used throughout the entire state of the district report. So enrollment. Uh, so what's our 30-year enrollment history look like? Slow and steady. Uh, 8,000 students were educated within the walls of our schools um, in 1993 with 2,023 students, or I'm sorry, 9,200 students in 2023. We've had three Pennsylvania Economy League studies that had studied our enrollment and projected out. We had five years of PDE or Pennsylvania Department of Education enrollment studies, as well as Crabtree Rohrball has studied our enrollment and all conclude the same thing, slow growth over time. If you look within the last 10 years, we did have increase in enrollments from 2011 to 2017 of about 700 students, but that has plateaued from 2018 to 2023 at 9,200. And, and when I say plateaued, it has plateaued for the students that physically come to school in our school district. Um, despite what you see with all the developments around us, we are not seeing major uh, increases in students attending school um, in Chambersburg School District. However, let's look at school choices uh, people have in Pennsylvania. So I'm not bringing in the charter schools, but I am bringing in cyber charter schools at this point. So in 2014, you can see at the bottom of that column, there were 649 students uh, attending for-profit or state cyber schools um, and 72 students were in our CVA and it had different names in the past. And then 246 students were homeschooled. Fast forward to that to current year enrollment of 2024, it's 1,373 students. The key is in this slide, uh, cyber school and homeschool have doubled enrollments in a 10 year window. 
the question we have to ask ourselves in this self-study and moving forward is, what would that look like in 2034? If our students will double in the next 10 years, um, what does that mean for programming? What does that mean for staffing? What does it mean for enrollment within the school walls of Chambersburg School District? Um, that's a really big question for us, but the data is driving us to that question. The second question at the bottom in the, the asterisks, I bring into this um, school choice because at the high school level, there are options. You can attend the Career Magnet School, CMS, or you can attend a Franklin County Career and Technical Center. Um, if you look at our applications from Chambersburg, that's approximately 500 students apply to CMS or Franklin County Career, Career Center, and 300 get accepted roughly leaving 200 students without programming they're wanting or selecting, in addition to the 200 students just in the high school alone that are in the CVA, the Chambersburg Virtual Academy program from grades nine to 12. So the premise here is that if it doubles again in 2034, and we have 500 students, if not more students that are wanting program they can't get, it's telling us what we need to do um, in our future blueprint. So where are demographics? How much have they been changing? So on the left-hand side of 2015, you can see we were 52% free and reduced, special education 11%, and English language learner at 5%. Interestingly, with the free and reduced um, from 2015 all the way to 2022, we're right around that 52%, but in 2023, it went up to 65. Um, if you look at the 2023 side, our special ed students, uh, percent of our population is 16%. Uh, when special ed was 11%, and then our English language learner, our biggest jump um, at 11% over the, the window of eight years, seven, eight years to 14%. So if you put this in student numbers over 10 years, we approximately have a thousand additional struggling students, um, not over 10 years, yeah, approximately 10 years, we have a thousand additional struggling students. So our demographics are changing. Um, if you go back to 2015, we were 68% white, 30%, 32% 32%, um, diverse. And fast forward to 2023, we're now 58% white and 42% diverse with the largest growth in our Hispanic population. Drilling down even further, who are our English learners? In 2013, there were 533 um, in October, first enrollment count. And fast forward to 2023, we're at 1331. And I think even now we're at 1400 plus. So it's a 154% increase in our English learner population. Now to you employees and staff members that I'm presenting to, you obviously know this, but this is also for the public and everyone else that is not attending school, nor do they see the change in our demographics or our population in the schools that we are seeing every day. So where do our finances stand? So when we look at our finances, uh, we're trying to compare how we compare to uh, peer districts. So down the center, we will have revenue, expenses, taxes, debt, and fund balance. Um, how do we compare? So let's go to the top. Uh, revenue per student on the peer districts average is 22,000 per student. Chambersburg is at 18,000. And you can see 17.5 on the expense side at 16.2. The third one here, local tax effort. Uh, it's a complicated formula, including um, uh, average salaries in a home, market value over houses, and about 10 other areas. It's a little complicated for me. But the goal of the formula was to say, are you undertaxing or overtaxing or right on with your local residents? And our local tax effort is 1.1, which is slightly above one. And that would be the target number is to be at one. Our peer districts are at 1.256. So we're taxing less than our peers, but slightly above average. What I wanna caution you is we're figuring out what this new number is because it is new to us. What does the 0.1 mean? How much is that above one should we be worried about overall? When you look at our debt, uh, we're at 9% of total expenses or the peer districts are at 9%, we're at 6%. So that debt is basically how much you invest in your facilities and your buildings uh, um, for upkeep and newness of the buildings. And then your fund balance per student, we are in line with our current fund balance per student. So one slide for finances. So now we're on to public perception. 
Um, and, and again, the detailed report has a lot more about finances overall, but I wanted to give you that summary. Public perceptions are driven by folks who maybe are not part of the school system, but live here and wanna know about the school. A lot of times they don't reach out um, or jump on our website or are engaged in our school through our various uh, media accounts. So if someone's moving here or not from here, how do they gain information, whether it's through real estate, uh, transaction businesses coming here, they have public perception websites they go to. Um, so these public perception web websites are just that, they're public perceptions. And so niche, niche in 2024 gave, gave off us an overall B minus or a 3.5 out of five stars with high rankings for diversity and athletics. Um, the U.S. News and World Report, which is a ranking that comes out every year. Um, the Magna School does qualify for a badge ranking because they placed in the top 40% of all high schools ranked that year. And we were 294th out of 665. And if you look at our elementary schools, Hamilton Heights ranks number one in Chambersburg Elementary Schools. And then they were 579th out of 1,452 elementary schools that were ranked. Uh, again, that places us in the top 40% um, of schools, according to U.S. News and World Report. And then if you look at schooldigger.com, the school district gets a 381 ranking out of 606 school districts. And then if you look at greatschools.org, they would give in 2022, that's the latest data they have, five schools below average, nine schools average, and three schools above average. And those above average would be North, South, and Guilford Hills. Again, pr public perception sites are just that. They all use the metrics differently and give it different weighting uh, to come up with these perceptions. What did our survey in March of 2023 tell us about uh, the staff, students, and parents, what they said about Chambersburg? So in real short version, 82% uh, of secondary and 94% of students um, in elementary feel safe. Um, and then our teachers and staff in general are doing a good job with responses exceeding 80% for the majority of the questions asked. We have very high trust in our staff. However, bullying continues to surface as a concern. And I think we would just want to change that word from bullying to just conflict. Uh, bullying has a specific definition that's very different. But in general, we do have uh, too many social conflicts or bullying conflicts in our schools, uh, along with some discipline that is uh, less effective nowadays than maybe historically. And then uh, some, some highlights about what some root causes may be, cell phone usage, technology in general, and social media are some potential root problems specifically in secondary schools. And then some suggestions were made to ramp up internal incentives and the climate and of each building being very positive and safe and ramping up those school climate um, approaches. So moving forward to our educational performance, um, we I looked at a pre-pandemic to post-pandemic PSSAs and keystones. So this slide is a percent of advanced and proficient students by grade level and subject prior to the pandemic in 2019 and post-pandemic in 2023. The coloring system would indicate uh, whether you're above the state average in blue, at the state average in green, or and then below the state average in red the numbers are the percent proficient and advanced. So across the country, pre to post pandemic, uh, schools lost ground. The question is how much did you lose ground in comparison? And in comparison to what? The state and yourself. So you can see in English language arts, we lost ground um, from 63% of the students in third grade to 46% and so on. So we moved generally from um, blue and green uh, with one, two reds in 2019 to all reds and one blue in our elementary school division. So we certainly have some work to do there, but the data is pointing us in, in that direction that we lost ground, but lost more ground than the state overall. And stay tuned for a slide coming up when we compare ourselves to peer districts, not just the state average. Same slide, pre-pandemic to post-pandemic, 2019 to 2023. Um, middle schools were strong before the pandemic and remain strong post pandemic. So that, that's an anomaly. Congratulations to the middle schools for strong um, performance and continuing to perform pre and post pandemic across the board with one concern in grade six um, math dropping below the state average. However, seventh grade, they recovered 
and are above the state average uh, post pandemic when before the pandemic they were below. Um, so some good, good data there to share. High schools, if you take both the magnet school and Cassius along with eighth grade students who take the Keystone exam, specifically in algebra um, in middle school, uh, this is how we've performed. So blue across the board pre-pandemic, uh, we dropped in literature to at the state average, maintain in blue um, above the state average. So uh, example in algebra one, we were 41% proficient and dropped to 37%. Uh, you can see that's a 4% drop, but we still maintained above the state average. So that, that does show we, we dropped with everyone else, but we stayed above the state average. Good signs there. So our overall standardized testing in PSSA and Keystones, prior to the pandemic, we had three grades and or subjects below the state average. Post-pandemic, we are up to seven. Uh, so we have a little bit of work to do to recover any learning loss uh, as a result of the pandemic or exposed from the pandemic. Now, how do we compare to our peers? So if you look at those 10 school districts and rank us on PSSAs on the far left column, we if you take the grades three through eight and you add up uh, all the proficiencies and compare it to the other schools, we rank second in ELA, third in math, and second in science. When you move to the Keystone testing rank, uh, um, out of the schools, we rank eighth out of 10 in algebra, biology eighth, and literature as well eighth. So there's a great juxtaposition to the state. While in the middle school, we've maintained strong performance in keystones and in secondary and high school with um, keystones, when you compare to peer districts, we lost ground uh, in high school. So we should be doing better in our peer districts in comparison um, with our, our high schools. When you narrow it down to economically disadvantaged students on PSSAs only, we maintain um, that they're in second out of 10 in ELA, second out of 10 in math, and second out of 10 in science. So that's, that's a good sign that our economically disadvantaged students did not drop in rank in comparison to peer districts to all students. However, conversely to that, our English language learners did lose ground in comparison to our peer districts ranking sixth in ELA, sixth in math and fourth in science out of the 10 districts when you look at PSSA proficiencies. And special education maintains strong performance, second out of 10 in ELA, second in math and second in science overall. So how do our capstone schools or your, your high schools compare with different metrics? So this is a way to look at our comparison of percent of students doing X. So in the peers column, that would be the other schools that are like us, if you average them. And then in the center column is how Chambersburg has performed and then the state average. So on one chart, all our high school performance overall is looking at attendance, graduation in four years, advanced on industry-based learning assessments, what percent of students are accessing rigorous courses of study, and then graduates to school, military, or work uh, with their credential. So the darker color of the blue is above the state average, the yellow is below the state average, and then the state average is that red fuchsia type color. And I'm colorblind, so if I'm off on my colors, please excuse the color blindness there. Um, however, um, the state average for attendance is 74%. And I want to stop there for a minute. This is a new metric uh, that has been released in the last couple of years. Overwhelmingly high 80 to low 90% of our students attend school every day. This metric is not that. This metric is indicating who is his, who is chronically absent. So the state average is 74% of the students are not chronically absent, which means you haven't missed more than 18 days. So the state has 26% of the students who have missed more than 18 days of school uh, in a school year. Chambersburg is at 66% of the students are not chronically absent and our peers are at 65. So again, the majority of students are attending every day. It's narrowed down to those that are uh, chronically absent. You can be chronically absent and still high performing. You can be chronically absent and low performing, which is predominantly what you see, but not always. You could have an injury and some other examples, but the state has created this metric of chronically absent. For your graduation, graduation rate, 87% state average, Chambersburg 81%, and our peers are at 87%. Uh, students that are taking industry-based learning assessments, are they performing advanced? 
The state average is six, Chambersburg is eight, and our peers are eight. There's courses of study, so who's taking your advanced coursework and rigorous courses um, that are identified across all schools. So 55% of the students in the state average, 49% Chambersburg and 46% peers. And then the uh, graduates, what are our graduates doing with graduating credentials? We have 76% in the state average, 70% in Chambersburg and 74% with our peers. So slightly below uh, the state average, but maintaining with our peers overall. Safety, I dabbled in slightly, so I'm very appreciative that the police department in Chambersburg has this data uh, tracking by incident, uh, what our issues are overall and what we're seeing show up at the steps and the, inside the walls of the school district. So in 2022 and 2023, you can begin new trends because the 2020 and 2021 data is pretty sporadic due to COVID. So disorderly conduct is a great example in 2022, there were 129 and then a drop to 107. And then currently up till February, we're at 90. So we'll see if that maintains on the trend line or goes below. And so this is for the whole district and all the schools in the district. Uh, anonymous reporting, so our safe to say uh, system. This is just anonymous reports, parents, students, staff, whoever says, hey, I'm worried about so-and-so and maybe suicidal. That's a life sa safety uh, report. So you can see over time, that doesn't mean it was an actual safety event, it's just someone reporting it. So if you see something, say something, that doesn't mean they're all um, what the person believes, but they report it anyway. So you can see over time where our safe to say reports come in each year with a, a 223 to present at 99. So running that 140, and again, the 2020, 2021 school year with the pandemic doesn't count for trend lines. Um, so running 140 to 170 in range. So where are we going with this data? What does it mean to us? What are our opportunities? So in general, we have five schools excelling. Uh, we have safe schools and a caring staff, which is a great opportunity for us to continue to build, um, build on. We are meeting expectations across the board academically, but not for all students. And we have a low cost per student, but that is fading. So our expectation of performance, you can start to see declining slightly when you look at our comparisons to the peers and also the state. So a little worried about our changing demographics and our sliding academic performance. We do have four schools in improvement status. And by, by the way, all peer schools have multiple schools in improvement status identified by the state. And that would be both our high schools, Buchanan and Stevens. And those schools get on improvement status for performance in a subgroup, uh, attendance or graduation or some combination thereof. Um, highest student to staff ratio compared to peers, while I didn't have a slide on this in the full report, you will see we have the most uh, students to staff or the highest students to staff ratio. So we're getting pretty good performance for the, the high number of students to staff we have. Uh, opportunity and concern around elementary learning loss and our slower recovery there. And then uh, our certainly our changing demographics that have a higher need and need different programming along with our English language learner programming as a must uh, to enhance upon. Um, also, I wanna circle back to the school choice, especially in high schools. You know, we have those 500 high school students that are seeking credentials and certifications in a different way or format, be it career tech, career magnet school uh, with additional programming or some version um, for what students need and what they're telling us uh, they need in those schools. And then the last one, our elementary special education facilities and our ELL students don't have space and or programs in all of our elementary schools. We just don't have the space. We do in some schools, but not others. And so we have some facilities to review in our elementary buildings to see if we can add some spaces due to our special education population. Specifically, our autism classrooms are expanding. And every time you have an autism classroom, it's a full classroom and has eight students in it and a couple adults. Um, it does take up a lot more of our space. And that has changed drastically um, in the last 10 years. Um, specifically, example would be Fayetteville alone, elementary school, I believe has eight or nine autistic classrooms uh, in that school because we have the space there. Um, so we have to really look at those facilities. So there are the opportunities moving forward from the self-study. Uh, and I'm sure there are more, I didn't hit all of them, but these were the emerging primary ones. So when transitioning to a blueprint, so 
the data is in there, the self study is complete. Uh, let's just say hypothetically, we agree to the majority of it, maybe not perfectly, but moving forward, how can we create a blueprint um, for a school of distinction? So if our goal is to have schools that are uh, a status of distinction, however you wanna classify distinction right now, um, we're, we'll work on that. But what does it mean? How do we move forward? So I highlighted on the right-hand side what, what I think schools of distinction have in common when you go throughout the state and look at high-performing schools. So they're generally decentralized, more than centralized. They're focused on the content students are learning and not so much test-driven. And they have a lot more projects where the students have agency, they're owning, they're learning more than being told what to learn. Um, and it's very people and experience focused versus technology and program focused. And then we, there's more prevention and intervention versus remediation. So an example there would be if you wait until a, a, a student fails and then offer summer school, that's remedial. We would like to get involved way sooner if we see a student struggling and have systems in place to intervene and prevent. Another example there would be maybe um, working hard with families and community to have our students ready for kindergarten before they show up at the door. If they show up at the door, they're not ready. We have a lot of remedial work to do and intervention work to do. Um, we also see in high performing organ organizations a lot more collaboration and team and small group accountability versus an individual, very isolated accountability. And an extensive focus on schools, less on the district, and a heavy, heavy emphasis on quality of what we do and not the quantity of what we do. And then the last component was more involvement in the school, not just communication. So we don't want to mix communication for involvement. So how do we keep our parents involved, get more families involved, get our community agencies involved right in the school? And we have some examples of that, but more systemically, specifically in our elementary uh, division. So Maryland has a blueprint. Uh, I think it's been up for about two years and they're still organizing around the blueprint, but they have narrowed their focus to five areas. And I'm just giving this as an example of what a blueprint is. Uh, but their next 10 years is focusing on early childhood, high quality, diverse staff, college and career readiness, more resource, resources for students that struggle. And if you dive into that, that's your English language learners and your special education students, and then a heavy governance and accountability for implementation of the blueprint. So what would our blueprint involve? So we're starting to review our educational blueprint and identifying basically our English language learners certainly need uh, enhanced programming as an example, but we'll lay out an educational blueprint um, and then we'll marry that with a facility feasibility study and to match the educational programs. And then we will certainly invest in people, time and students to deliver on that blueprint. So those are three cornerstones or three pillars for us on how we're gonna do some version of a Chambersburg school district blueprint, or uh, as we can call it, schools of distinction by 2030. And so what are the next steps for, for us? So March is the release of the state of the district report. We're gonna spend a lot of time communicating outside the district and inside the district. Um, we will then release the, a community survey to help us prioritize future efforts. So I'm gonna highlight a whole bunch of areas that are important to Chambersburg and have the community, student, staff, parents chime in on what they believe are our most important areas to improve upon. Uh, that ranking and prioritization will give us good feedback on where we're headed and marry that with what we're seeing. Then uh, from April through June, we'll focus on developing a blueprint for schools of distinction. That'll be our roadmap over for the next five to six years. Um, and then if you fast forward to the fall, we will have our facility feasibility study complete that marries the blueprint and our educational programming to some degree. And it says, well, if we need more special ed ELL programming or a, a fifth special in elementary, for example, we don't have the space, here's what we need. And then we have the space uh, be, be evaluated and built um, or reconfigured in some way. And then in November, we recommend action plans related to the facility feasibility study and our blueprint uh, financially. How do we move our blueprint forward over the next five or six years? So very daunting, uh, big task ahead of us, but it's worth the time, energy, and effort to tackle some type of blueprint that is more systemic throughout the district. I hope you found the state of the district informative. 
I appreciate you watching, listening, and I'll be out to staff meetings to get some feedback from you, but also to do some Q&A um, in the buildings and also throughout the community. Thanks everyone, and I hope to see you soon.